We are sitting in office chairs on the turf at Superior Athletics. I'm here with Billy Rum. Bill, can you give us one fun fact about yourself? Uh, I like anime. Oh, I didn't know that. I know you didn't. That's fun. No one knows that except for my girlfriend. She's like, I really uh, love that my former football player, wrestler, strength coach, like, really is like big on watching yeah. anime. This I think it's fun. Yeah, um, so you like anime? Yep. You've done like a bunch of other sports. Tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, Tell them about your background. I know your background. Oh wow. Uh, played sports for a long time. Got hurt. Uh, rehab myself. Did things wrong. Uh, got hurt again. That pretty much ended the sports career. Uh, decided to start training other athletes and people because I was, you know, relatively good at my sports and I was strong and. Fell in love with coaching, coached a baseball team, never played yeah. baseball before. Yeah. Uh, coached a baseball team, loved helping kids. Our team went to the championship game. It was totally the bad news bear story. And I started to realize I loved that. And I was going to school for marketing at uh, Stony Brook University. Yeah. And I realized, you know, when I was starting to get ready for interviews uh, to do marketing consulting, that uh, I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. And I loved coaching people and I liked helping people and I uh-huh. liked being strong and making kids badass. So. Yeah. I started to do that. Uh, fast forward, first six months at New York Sports Club, so mm-hmm. Town Sports International, or wherever it is, if you're in Boston, it's Boston Sports Club. Yeah. Uh, I was one of the top 10 trainers in my region. I was also running this facility. I was doing about 65 to 70 hours of hands-on training a week, and life was great. I loved it. Um, I still love it. My girlfriend jokes around with everybody that I wake up at 5.30 in the morning, I spring out of bed because I'm super jacked to go train, and I get home at nine o'clock at night, and she's trying to drag me out of the gym. It's, um, it's almost seven thirty on a Sunday. It's seven thirty on a Sunday. And I've been here since three, talking about fitness and strength and everything else yeah. with people I love to talk about fitness and strength with, and this is life. Written for T Nation, yeah. Elite FTS, mm-hmm. Stack dot com. Have my own website. What's your website? Superior Athletics dot training. On YouTube, people do this, and the link appears, so I'll try to do that. The link is somewhere up here in the universe, or it's down there in a corner, or it's over here in the corner, or it's right over my face. I don't know what the field of the camera is. It's large. (laughs) Um, Speaking of large, this facility is fucking big. This facility is gigantic. You can Uh, say fucking, it's fine. Tell us more about Superior. Uh, So we work with athletes from, our youngest athlete is four, um, but he doesn't really train with us officially, but he can deadlift more than his body weight. Uh, He can overhead squat. We're teaching him how to do Turkish get-ups just for fun. This is nothing else. Um, And then we have some kids groups. We have guys who are professional athletes playing CFL, NFL, MLB, stuff like that. Uh, But mostly high school, college age athletes. A few adults. That's awesome. And uh, what's one thing that you find all of your athletes need to work on from their first day here? All athletes need to work on from their first day here. Uh, Being humble about learning exercise. Uh, Every athlete goes out and they play their sport and they pick up the sport that they love so easily Mm -hmm. that when they walk into the weight room, the weight room doesn't necessarily come easily. Yes. So for a lot of them, they'll tend to think like, oh, I, I should be really awesome at this immediately, and when they don't get it immediately, yeah. they want to almost quit because they haven't had that, 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 that barrier, that wall yet in their life, and this becomes that for the first time. Mm-hmm. And our job is to kind of tell them that the barrier is, is the right thing to do. Right. Get over it, don't go around it, and when you get over it, the next barrier will be easier, and that'll be trying to make varsity when you're older or trying to you know, started in your college team or get a division one scholarship. And those barriers are the real big rocks. But if you have never had that setback or that pullback, you're, you're not gonna know what it's like. And the weight room for a lot of athletes is a barrier for them, yeah. all the way up to the pros. Yeah. I know guys who, you know, NFL players who don't like to lift weights right. and they're just naturally always been freaks and the weight room helps them once they learn about it. But it's, mm. a lot of the time it's later yeah. and that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in, in my world, in, in what is essentially general population training, we see that all the time where the weight room has some sort of 
hindrance to somebody's like emotional well-being, right? And they get them there and they go, oh my God, those are weights. Like, I don't lift weights. Mm. Like those guys that were assholes in high school lift weights. I don't lift weights. Um, yeah. And, and that's, it's true. Like the, the, the weight room, it, it holds, hard work is done there. Mm -hmm. And some people are okay with putting their hard work out there for everybody to see. Right. And a lot of people are, especially people who had trouble with the weight room, were introverted. So again, I liked anime. Yeah. And I lived weights and was a captain of my football team. So right. I'm, I'm a weird case anyway. Mm -hmm. So I lived the nerdy lifestyle. Like I love, I, I read the you know, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I, I loved the Lord of the Rings. And that's not necessarily, oh, hey, that's the easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. I sang in chorus. Yeah. You know, I did Nisma and all that stuff. It's the as, best. As you did. You just won my heart. Um, and so I, I was on different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But I'm okay to put my, my work out there publicly and say, right. I, I will work hard in front of other people and fail. And if you see me fail, that's okay. Because yeah. failure for me is a barrier that we get over, we get better. Right. For other people, they don't like to put that failure out there. Right. And I think that's why the weight room holds that anxiety is because right. someone who wasn't physically oriented from the time they were younger has difficulty traversing the weight room right. and failing. Right. So we try to give them as low barrier entry as possible so they have success, so they fall in love with it. Um, I wish we just did that with everyone when they were younger. Right. I know, I understand that's why people took dodgeball out but instead of taking dodgeball out, how do we give a lower barrier to it and build it in that everybody can do it? Right. And that it's got a point for everyone. Yeah. And give kids a physical culture that they enjoy. Right. I know that when I was doing my degree work for health and phys ed, one of the reasons I'm not teaching in a school right now is because I'm teaching in a different school right now. And, and for me, it's about physical education. I think that the bottom line of what we do as trainers is physical education. We're teaching people how to physically move how to use their bodies in space. I don't one step removed from that. It's how to think about what they're doing and how to problem solve and how to work hard. And what we're doing in the weight room, like this facility and training facilities are a great tool for something else. What are we working towards other than just a deadlift? Like deadlifting is awesome. I think we agree that deadlifting is the shit. I think that if the only thing you're working on is a deadlift, then like there's something else missing. And, and I agree, like, I, we were having a conversation before that I had two clients who were brothers and they trained together a couple times a week and then mm -hmm. by themselves a few days a week. Yep. And uh, they're both lawyers and they, they, they love fitness for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But when they are here, they compete against each other. And my session, you know, yesterday, they're chasing after each other in their conditioning drill and they're laughing mm -hmm. the entire time. And it's 45 seconds of go as hard as you can and don't get caught followed by a minute and 30 seconds of relax, catch your breath and get ready. And they're laughing the entire time, like right. giggling to the point that I'm worried that they're gonna hyperventilate because yeah. they're not getting enough oxygen. Yeah. And like, or, or, and, and, or too much, they're, they're, they're gasping it. And we, we started doing this movement training where I was teaching them how to march, skip, and, and do all this fundamental stuff that sports performance yeah. so that they were healthier and they could run and they could do drills like this. So right. we built them for a skill so they could have fun. Uh -huh. And now because they don't get hurt doing it, they love it and they're having such a great time. Right. And I think that's where we have to build for people is a physical culture that they enjoy. Right. But it comes with us being able to give people experience and teach them exercises that, they, that can help why they can help, but ultimately get them towards something that they want to do. Right. You know, if we're doing it just for us, we're failing. Yeah. Um, that made me think of uh, this quote that I use every time I present. It's in everything to kind of like unify the uh, the audience when I'm speaking. Don't be with. an asshole. No, that's usually my finisher. That's my don't be an asshole finisher. Uh, no, this one is from George Graham, who's a former president of the of the National Physical Education Association, and he said that the goal of that is to give people the skills to which when they're ready for it, they choose to be physically active. I mean, that's what we're doing, right? We're like giving people a skill set, a movement skill set that they can go choose to do it on their own. And uh, what you just said made me think of a quote that I'm now gonna make up, that Mike Boyle talks about like the first rule is don't hurt people during mm -hmm. their session. Like don't get hurt while you work out. Um, and I think that from the beginning, that should be don't emotionally hurt people when they start. Right? When somebody has their first day in your facility or their first training session, 
if you make them feel bad about it, that's not going to be a place that resonates with them. That's not going to be a place that they want to return to. So if from the beginning you can celebrate those small victories, knowing that there's going to be small levels of defeat, as long as you keep working on it, and that's going to be a much stronger experience for people while they physically get stronger. And I think that like I'm lucky uh, to the degree that because we work with a large population of athletes, so youth athletes, mm -hmm. we have kids who come in and they're not necessarily going to be college level athletes. Right. But when they come here and they train and they develop and they get better, they see a tangible result of better. You know, they're running faster, they're lifting more weights, they're doing mm -hmm. more stuff, but they're 14 years old. And they've now found a connection with the weight room that, that, that'll last the rest of their lives. Right. And they'll always associate this with fun. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I also associate this with, this is what you can do when you're 50. Right. How do I know this? I did it with two lawyers yesterday and they're doing the same kinds of stuff. Yeah. And they're, you know, four decades old. Right. And it's okay to do it at both age levels. Mm -hmm. It's how do we, we make this a cultural thing that they know they can continue to do. Because everybody stops playing. And you don't have to stop playing, you just have to find a new playground. That's so good. That's so good. <laughs> really fucking good quote, dude. That was good. And you had on your notes before yeah. that, that I really want to get into because mm -hmm. it's something we kind of talked with uh, Doc before. Yeah. Uh, leading from the front versus being yes. a follower in the, in the strength and conditioning industry. Yeah. Um, one of the things, and I'm, I'm speaking to the coaches who decide to, to watch this and not just the generals also, is we've made this industry and we've made fitness something where everybody's chasing after being the smartest person and knowing the most and having the largest toolbox. Absolutely. But you're not gonna use those tools enough that it's gonna have an impact on people's lives. And it's better to be a master craftsman with probably five tools it's maybe 10 tools then yeah. I have you know a huge tool shed filled with stuff that collects dust right. because you may be able to tell me why it works you may be able to tell me why it's important but if it's something that someone uses in the first you know month of them being in fitness mm -hmm. and then they never touch it again you're not leading from the front yeah you're, you're just having information for the sake of information and and knowledge without action is wasted knowledge and I think we need less knowledge and more action Yes. And I think that's where the next lead from the front can be. Mm -hmm. And for everybody is stop learning so much. This is for yeah. everyone. Stop learning so much and start putting into action the things you do know more often. And I think that's where you'll get really awesome. But don't put your head in the sand and say that a packed shoulder is good for you all the time when yes. it's not. You know, don't say that something is always the best when it's definitely not always the best. Be open-minded to what else is out there. Mm -hmm. and, and what about you? What do you think for the lead from the front versus the following aspect of fitness? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because I see the merit to going down whatever rabbit hole tickles your fancy. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of that becomes this like self-fulfilling, masturbatory learning where you learn this thing because it feels great and you want to be the person that knows this. And then how you implement that information you don't. You don't implement that information. So mm -hmm. I'm really focused right now on context over content, right? Like if you put it in a great setting, it's going to work. Right. You can have the best program in the world, the best nutritional strategy in the world, and if somebody's not doing it, that program sucks, and that diet should be burned because no one's using it, right? What's the point yeah. of it? Um, so it's sort of to me like painting a picture and then just leaving it on the shelf, right? Like there's absolutely merit to creating it for yourself. And I think that there's merit to that for trainers who want to learn some of the complex stuff. But if you can't use it and you can't let somebody somebody else's life become better because of that, I don't know why we're focused on some of those things. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's let's do an example. Okay. Mark Fisher Fitness. Yeah. How well would that gym do in a Amish community? You know, I am very confident that we would figure out how to not curse how to not have extreme levels of profanity, how to have Matt Wilson and Brian Pesci Murphy keep their clothes on. Uh, I think we could figure it out. Well, but that's a great point. But what works, and that, that's the thing that I think is the difference, is people look at the methods and they don't look at the principles. Right. I think the principles that make Mark Fisher Fitness one of the best gyms that 
is out there as a whole complete package is the principles around why they build, why you guys build, yeah. the, the culture that you guys do. And you decided that the people you were looking to serve would be best served in the way that you guys do it. Right. Your leading from the front is putting aside not necessarily your guys' own egos, but it's putting aside what maybe was all of your best ways of training yourselves mm -hmm. and the ways that you guys learned fitness. Right. You sculpted it to what people wanted and needed. And now you serve a community in a great way, the way they want to be served. Right. By un by staying true to your principles. Your methods could change. But yeah. if you do that exact same thing in an Amish community and you let them churn butter in the middle of their session and right. you were doing things that related to them yeah. and you were talking about the things that related to them, I think that's the real golden nugget behind MFF and the success. And it's then also that you know, you guys go out and get great coaches and have a great community and are mm -hmm. not afraid to put shit on the line and say, hey, this is why we're doing this and yeah. this is what we're doing and, you know, we're, we're going to be awesome. I also think, by the way, the uprising is totally awesome. I think that's great. I also am I'm, I'm down right now to, mm -hmm. to say that if anybody ever wants me to donate my time or donate anything, I, I'm down for it. Oh, uh, so I, will, just got excited. I will come to New York City and I will work with kids and I will... Yes show anybody how to do some of the stuff that we do with kids so yeah. I'm, I'm with it but that's awesome. you guys that's part of what connects your culture is that wasn't something you did because it worked because it was a method right you did it because it was part of the principles that made mark fisher fitness great right and it's it's a if, right. it, if i tried to do it it's disingenuous to where we are right now mm -hmm. i'm just doing a, a method for right. the sake of doing a versus method you because it's a thing. versus yeah. I'm doing this because this is in line with the principles that make you guys who you are and that's leading from the front I yeah I think that's something that, that we've been striving to do specifically with like the MM lab one of my goals with the MM lab was to make an event where we can take new information and then integrate it as fast as possible like literally 45 minutes later mm -hmm. you took that information and said this is how I'll use it with my practice the distance that we get in coaching land from I'm going to a conference on Friday, I'm going to a conference on Saturday, Sunday. Now I have to try to figure it all out on Sunday night before I do some of it on Monday. And I don't get to unwrap or unleash a long-term plan. It's a problem for a lot of coaches. They go to an event, they do that stuff for a week and then they kind of default to the other standard that they've created for themselves. With the MM Lab, we said, let's lead, let's change how we approach fitness education. Can we make this an event where you can practice it at the actual conference, then go do it in your in your practice, right? Can you do it here at Superior? Can we learn something from Tony Jellencore and go do that at Mark Fisher Fitness? I think that's a version of leading from the front, right? How quickly can you take new information and take that content and evaluate and create a context where people actually want to do it? Monday morning takeaways. Yeah. What can you actually do on Monday mornings? And I'm, I'm a big proponent of wanting to get those. So right. like, when I took over this facility and, and and bought it, started my business, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to bring in people to talk to my coaches and myself yeah. and give their content in the context of our facility. Right. So my coaches had less of a stretch and less of a jump between this is the information we took. Now we go home and how do we fit right. it in our facility? No, this is the way that our facility is, and this is the content at the same time. Right. How is it executed in our facility? Yeah. So it, it cuts that learning curve, but I, right. I had Todd Baumgartner in, and some of the stuff that he's done, and he's talked to us at that at that time, yeah. we implemented right away. You know, things that Miguel Granchillo came in and told us, implemented and put in right away. I've had the luxury of talking to you, you know, pretty consistently, and having yeah. mastermind meetings with you for three years almost yeah. now, so like, I've been able to unpack things. We went to perform better. We skipped out on stuff to so go out and sit and like figure, talk it, figure it out. Say yeah. like, hey, what what is this? What what is going on? What is this? Mm -hmm. What is that? You know, instead of just hey, we talked about before. Instead of just getting more knowledge, it was actually getting more thinking going. Right. And thinking about implementation and thinking about how to use things and thinking about what is actually did we just learn. What's right. the what's the, the nuggets that we'll take and we'll do stuff with? Because knowledge without action is wasted knowledge. There's only so much you can take in and implement, and then over time it, it disappears. You forget. Right. 
and it's gone. And what was the point? Yeah, I think that right now in my career, I'm working on developing this filter of, I'm called the filter of actionability, but that sounds super pretentious. But like scaling, right, and, and being able to filter out the stuff that does is a one trick pony, can only serve one function, and then contrasting that against the things that are tried and true and we can improve on, but appreciate that you have to have that basic understanding of knowledge first, right? Like you have to understand that we're gonna get 80% of the results from 80% of like the big rocks, right? Everyone says like, all right, we've got this 80, 20, we'll make 80% of my results from 20% of my actions, and then I'm gonna have 80 other 80% to, to mess around with. Like, no, you're not. Go pick up a fucking bar. Yeah. Like, go pick up a bar and let that be your minimum, and then figure out the other stuff that Fill makes in. picking up the bar more excitable or more uh, intriguing for people. Mm -hmm. And that's that's we're sticking with the whole concept of lead from the front yeah. versus you know following is then it comes down to an individual basis. You know, leading for, for you from the front with fitness for yourself right now yeah. is you spend more time on the bike. Yeah. You know, and, and when you weren't doing that, you weren't as happy with your fitness lifestyle as you right. are now. And I don't think that there's any strength and conditioning coaches who their niche is mountain biking, maybe you're the guy. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> Like, but in all seriousness, like you found for yourself what right. fitness means for you and what your thing is. Yeah. And oh well, you know Harold's not training to deadlift more, and he can't lift three times his body weight in a deadlift. Such a sissy now. But you know that that's great. But you you really love where you're at. You yeah. live a good life, and that's your thing. You have principles. Right. Be active. And like find fitness. Yeah. You have methods. Whatever the fuck you enjoy with that. Yeah, and it's funny because I would consider my most recent training incredibly successful because I rode 30 miles of downhill yesterday and like fell off the bike twice. I didn't get hurt, honey. And he's good, kid. But I rode 30 miles of downhill yesterday, felt awesome, and like have been riding the bike more, and it's impacted a little bit of my approach to how I discuss exercise with people, and as an example, like focusing on the overall principle. Somebody recently at MFF said, like, hey, you've been losing, you've been losing body fat. Like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm riding my bike. And they said, oh, cool, should I? And there was an ellipsis before I let them finish that. I said, hey, you should focus on your diet first. You should focus on getting strong second. You should make sure that when you are doing some sort of interval training like our classes at MFF, you hit it hard. Like you don't need to do three two hour bike rides in a week like I've been having a blast doing as a hotness goal, right? I'm not doing it because I think it's gonna make me look better. I'm doing it because it's fun as hell. And it's byproduct. And as a byproduct, like I've burned through some body fat. Like yeah. great. I great. lost I lost thirty pounds one summer. Mm. Uh, from when I was a kid. Yeah. And I at one point in time was two eighty five. Yeah. Uh I was playing basketball, full court, full length mm -hmm. basketball, four times a week mm -hmm. for probably three hours a day in the summertime. Yeah. And I lost a shit ton of weight. You know what I was eating every day? No. Wendy's. Wendy's. I was having junior bacon cheeseburgers and everything else all the time. Yeah. Focused almost nothing on the diet. I didn't recognize, but I was lifting weights for an hour and a half a day. Yeah. Probably four or five times a week. I was playing three hours of full court basketball, up and down, running up and down, jumping, sprinting, changing direction, doing all this stuff. I lost weight. It was never the intention. Yeah. At that time, was I need to lose weight? It just happened. And I think that's the the, the money maker. Is can you find fitness? Like someone asks you, should I start riding my bike so that I can get fit? I don't know. Should you? Like, is that what you love to do? If you right. hate sitting on a bicycle seat, like. Not a huge fan of sitting on a bicycle seat. It hurts my ass. Like, I have a butt pad in my pants for that. Right? So, like, I don't really love doing it. If I did, yeah, it would have come some aesthetic benefits if I did a shit ton of the things I love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know, playing video games made you lose a shit ton of weight, you could play video games and you'd be in yeah. awesome shape. Yeah. Reality yeah. is, is there's certain things we love that can help, and certain things yeah. we have 
if, if I didn't eat, if I was that kid who died because he forgot to eat because he was playing World of Warcraft, yeah. like, if I lost a shit ton of weight because I was never eating because I was playing a shit ton of World of Warcraft, yeah. is it the best thing? No. Are you going to get a benefit? Sure. Should you follow the World of Warcraft diet? No. Probably not. Not really. Yeah. But find the thing that you love and do a lot of it and you'll right. get what you want out of it. Yeah. But that goes back to what we were saying before. People don't know where their playground is anymore. Mm-hmm. They remember where it used to be, right. but they don't know where theirs is now. And I yeah. think everybody should kind of, I, I wrote an article, I think, yeah. about exploring fitness. Yeah. And it was, explore everything. Take right. a chance, if there's a flag football league you wanna play, go play. Go play, go play. There's volleyball, go play. Remember, just sign up for a soccer league. Yeah. You played soccer as a kid, haven't played in like 10 years. Wanted to do a soccer league. Yeah. Um, I think some of it is like, we're, we're all wanderers, right? Because we all knew where the playground was. We all played on the playground. I think that at a young enough age, everyone actually enjoyed moving because we have this yeah. inherent drive to move. And we've learned along the way that moving is physically traumatic, emotionally traumatic. Some, in some way, shape, or form, it's, it's a meaning activity. People yeah. learn that through their years at school or, or what, whatever happened, happened to them in their life experiences. And we just have to figure out like you wander enough you'll find it but some people will always say you know exercise is not my thing and exercise is, is scary or I don't need to do it and as much as that's a specific individual conversation that needs to be had I think it almost always is some sort of excuse for not feeling comfortable moving or sweating or exercising yeah and that that, that fear of, of failing in front of other people yeah and how do we take that away from people, or how do we find a playground for them to go be on, right. or an activity to go do? Yeah. And you know, I come, the kids who come here, they, they know what their playground still is. Yeah. So we have that benefit for the adults that we train. It's teaching them that the playground is still there, right. and it's been there, and they just gotta remember how to you know, just do it. Yeah. And as they do, they have more fun, and they get great results because they're having fun. Right. And it, it, it gets crazy. Yeah, and I, I think, that a lot of the power in having somebody program for you or coach you is that you do get to focus so much more on the just do it side of things mm-hmm. rather than on the what is the best, how can I use this side of things. Yeah. Where for the user, right, for somebody who's writing their own exercises and is struggling to figure out what's best or goes to the gym and wants to do one thing but they get there and they see something else and they read the latest men's health article or whatever, like they don't know what to do. I think there's immense power and just having somebody say this is what you're going to do yeah. right and there, there's an issue when somebody says great i've got the program i'm not doing it that's like another problem to have yeah. which has a completely different approach to solving it but for the folks that say i do want to exercise they just don't know what to do like get a coach go see a coach get a trainer have somebody tell you what to do yeah. and then follow up with did you do it yes or no like, that's like the easy part. Yeah. The easy part is did you do it yes or no? The hard part is like doing it on a regular basis and doing it consistently. And and if, if people find things they like to do, they'll do it. But that also comes up to us as coaches, especially when we're working with certain people, right. is that we have to know when it's an exercise or it's something that people don't want to do. So like we have a girl who came in and she's like, I don't want to get big and bulky because right. I did gymnastics and when I did that, I got really muscular and I don't necessarily want that. Right. Um, so she was like, I also don't want to deadlift. And um, that, that obviously isn't gonna fly. I'm gonna make you deadlift. Yeah. But what a deadlift is might be different than what you think. Right. You know, we might be doing something different than normal deadlift. So yeah. she ended up deadlifting. We lowered her reps, and I said, "Hey, how did that feel?" She's like, "That's not that bad." I was like, "Is it fun? Would it be cool if you could do a record-breaking amount yeah. in our gym?" And she was like, "There's a record." And for her, competitiveness was always fun, mm-hmm. and she wanted to kind of chase after that. Yeah. But she's like, all right, is it going to make me big and bulky? And I showed her, you know, a picture of one of the girls who can, you know, do 225 pounds. Her reps the girl weighs 118 pounds. Yeah. And she's like, she's so small. Right. You don't have to get big and bulky. Right. You, you, we can make this fun for you. We just have to find what your fun is. Yeah. You know, so she's doing more kettlebell work than other people. She's getting to do get ups and she's getting to do, you know, kettlebell snatches. And she's yeah. like, this is fun and it's not what I thought weightlifting was. Right. She's, you know, bought in and sold and she enjoys it. Awesome. And I'm not the kettlebell guy. Mm-hmm. But if it's the right thing for the right person at the right time, we do right. use you use the appropriate tool, but one tool is not the appropriate tool for everything. Right. Yeah. It's Bill.
If you have one piece of advice for the listeners, what is it? Uh, wow, that was a heavy goodbye. Yeah. We went right into that. Um, <laughs> so one piece of advice that I would have for anyone out there listening is be in love with what you do, yeah. whether it's fitness, life, or anything else, but be open to alternatives. I may love to do strength and conditioning for athletes, and the things that work for me may not work for everybody, but I'm open to the idea of other modalities. The same way I love certain types of movies, but I'm open to watching something that might be outside the scope of what I would do, because I want to be open to what could possibly happen. So with fitness, life, anything else, find something that you love to do. Be unashamed that that's what you love to do, like I love anime. Um, and go and do it as much as you want and have fun with it. And when a chance comes along to maybe try something else, be open to at least giving it a shot, but know that you always have what you love. Yeah. And how we love to work. I'm open to other alternatives, yeah. but I love what I do. So I'll do this for forever, even if I make a billion dollars and I own the New York Mets. Yeah. I said the Mets, not the Yankees. Is that your Gary Vaynerchuk of the Mets? It, he's gonna own the Jets. I mean, he, he, he's gonna own the Jets. Honestly, my Gary Vaynerchuk is, I wanna own the Buffalo Bills. Oh. But I don't want to have to live in Buffalo. So uh, thank you very much for having a Tuesday talk on a Sunday with me. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to having another one. And then next time I'm going to have to come to you. Deal. And, and visit the Ninja Clubhouse of Glory and Dreams. Like glitter behind us. Make it rain. Falling from the sky. Make it rain glitter. Yeah. Thanks, dude. Thanks. <sighs>I, know. I edit all the time. I upload it. I upload it. I go through iMovie. I'm not, like taking my ass right now. I mean, I think the girls want to see your ass. That's part of the allure of Harold Gibbons. I will include this as a blooper at the end. Because would you? So I don't count you as a ginger. Uh, I. But you have some gingery features. I have some gingery beardness. Yeah. I just I can't stand next to Todd Bumgarner at all. So there's Todd. Yeah. There's Chris Merritt. And then there's you, and, yeah. and those are the three guys with red beards that I know of. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that you guys should have like a calendar that you do, that <laughs> the, the ginger beard calendar, and you go, and then who gets to be the gingerbread man in December is voted on by the people. <laughs> so that's, that would be like a digital calendar. I'll take this clip and put it on top of the wall. <laughs>